Hey guys, it's me, Lawlord, and pretty recently, I've had a pretty interesting idea. About two... So about two years ago, I made a video comparing the fighting capabilities of Shay Cormac and Connor Kenway from Assassin's Creed. But I didn't want that video to be the only video where I compare fighting capability and determine who I think would win in a hypothetical fight. No, I wanted to make more videos like that with future video games and future video game characters. So back to my previous statement that I recently had an interesting idea. From reading the title of this video, you would know what it is. But alas, that idea is comparing the capabilities of the last dragon born from Skyrim and the sole survivor from Fallout 4. Now, I want to start off by saying that this will be a somewhat difficult comparison to make. One, because they're from separate universes, each one having very different styles of combat and warfare from the other. Now, yeah, I am aware of that fan theory that the Elder Scrolls and Fallout take place in the same universe, but I personally disagree with that theory. And even if they did, the point that they have different forms of combat and warfare, that point still applies. And the other reason this will be a difficult comparison is because a lot of the factors are largely player dependent. So yes, this comparison will be a bit of a challenge, but all the more reason to make said comparison. So talking about my previous video about Shay Cormac versus Connor Kenway in Assassin's Creed, I didn't really have a very good format as to how I made that video. I just listed off different reasons as to why I think the person who I would win would win. But with this video, I'm going to make it quite different. I'm going to make each factor its own chapter or timestamp or whatever you want to refer to it as. And then at the end of the video, after considering all the factors, I will explain what my conclusion is. So enough talk, let's get into it. So the first metric that I'm going to start off with is physical strength. And this one I am going to have to give to the Dragonborn. And the reason for this is mainly due to the settings and environments that both characters have lived their lives in. You see, the Dragonborn lives in Temriel, which is at the same stage, technologically, that our own world was at during the Middle Ages. And the thing about the Middle Ages is that at that time, people were generally more physically strong than we are today. And that was simply because they had to be in order to do anything, because everything required a lot more physical strength, more work was a lot more manual. Travelling at the time, especially over long distances, was way more of a hassle than it is today. And yeah, basically, people in the Middle Ages, typically speaking, were a lot stronger because they had to be. And so back to what I mentioned before, Temriel in the Elder Scrolls universe is at that same technological level, which means that the last Dragonborn had to live in that same environment. Now you could say the same thing about the Soul Survivor to a degree, because after the nuclear war, it set pretty much the whole world's technological stage back to square one, although not completely, but anyway, you could say that the Soul Survivor is in a similar state when it comes to environment and would also require a lot more physical strength in order to survive day-to-day -day life. And that's certainly true, but there are two reasons why I still think The Last Dragonborn wins. The first one is that although the post-apocalyptic wasteland is a lot more manually demanding than the times prior to the nuclear war, it still isn't quite at the same level of Temriel, since post-nuclear war America still has robots, firearms, and other technologies that make life slightly easier. And my second reason is that the Soul Survivor's environment, that is a lot more physically demanding, is an environment that he has only entered recently. Prior to that, he has lived a relatively comfortable life with a butler robot, a society that's a lot more technologically advanced than we are in our own universe, etc. And has lived in that environment for the majority of his life. Whereas The Last Dragonborn, by comparison, has lived his entire life, up to the game Skyrim, in an environment that is a lot more physically demanding. And therefore has had a lot more time to increase his own physical strength. 
Now granted, the sole survivor, given that you're playing Nate, the male sole survivor, did fight in the Sino-American War, and could have been fighting that for quite a few years, considering how the war itself went for 11 years, but that still wouldn't be the same amount of time that The Last Dragonborn has, so The Last Dragonborn still has an advantage in this area. So physical strength I'm going to give to The Last Dragonborn. The next one is powers slash abilities. This one also goes to The Dragonborn, and the reason for this one is pretty obvious. The most obvious reason for this is that the Dragonborn has access to a large array of Dragon Shouts, 20 to be specific, all of which make the Dragonborn insanely powerful when compared to the average foot soldier. To be fair, the average foot soldier wouldn't even be a fair comparison, but you get my meaning. The most classic example, of course, is Vusrodar, or Unrelenting Force. This shout alone can be insanely strategic, since it throws enemies into the air, giving you time to catch them off guard when they land and need to get back up into the fight, or you can use this to straight up kill them by shouting them off a nearby ledge. Either way, this shout alone is extremely useful in combat, and as I mentioned, it's the most iconic shout in the game, but there are a few more examples that can be argued are even more powerful than that. Become Eternal, which makes the Dragonborn immune to damage for a number of seconds. During this time, the Dragonborn can't fight, but it's still useful to get out of near-death situations. Marked for Death, which does an insane amount of damage and does a significant debuff to an enemy's armor. And Bend Will, which as the name suggests, literally bends the will of the victims the shout is used against. And those are just four of 20 examples. And by the way, it should be noted that the Dragonborn's abilities are far more powerful in lore than they appear to be in gameplay. And it's not just the shouts, it's also the various schools of magic that the Dragonborn has access to. Yes, it's true that the Dragonborn may not access all of these schools of magic, if any of them, depending on their playstyle, but for the sole survivor, it would be literally impossible for him to. Yes, he can use chems to give him similar effects, but of course it wouldn't be the same. So of course, power and ability has to go to the Dragonborn. And speaking of chems, the next metric I'm going to talk about is equipment. This includes weapons, armor, and other equipment that would be used in combat. And other... This includes weapons, armor, and other equipment that would be used in combat. The Soul Survivor is obviously from a far more technologically advanced era, and therefore has far more technologically advanced equipment. For example, with weapons, the most powerful weapon that the Soul Survivor has access to is the Nuka Nuke Launcher, a modified Fat Man. Fat Man alone as a weapon would be quite a danger to the Dragonborn, due to its massive explosive damage, and the Nuka Nuke Launcher would have the same issue for the Dragonborn to a much higher degree, due to doing higher explosive damage and arguably having better range. As for armor, arguably the best armor at the Soul Survivor's disposal is XL1 power armor. This specific suit of power armor does certainly have a lot of perks, but the most significant one that would help in this context is its massive boost in physical damage defense. As for chems and potions, overall chems and potions, depending on what type of chems and potions they are, have very similar effects. For example, healing potions have the same effect as stim packs. Alas, I believe the Soul Survivor to be the clear winner when it comes to equipment. Now the next one will be a pretty short explanation because there's not much to say, that being strategies and tactics. Now this one's a hard one to compare because this one is like 90% player determined. But this is what I can say about it. Each one, the Dragonborn and the Soul Survivor, would have different tactics and strategies depending on their powers and ability. For example, the Dragonborn would have strategies centered around his shouts, like using Fusrodar at the right time, or using medieval warfare tactics, 
whereas the Soul Survivor would be more focused on modern day warfare tactics. And that is why I think when it comes to strategies and tactics, I think this one is a draw. I don't think one is inherently better than the other, they're both good just in different ways. We're now up to our last few metrics that we're going to measure before we come to our conclusion. The second last one that we're going to compare is feats. What each character has accomplished during the time we play as said characters during their respective games. So with the Soul Survivor, the main plot of Fallout 4 is centred around bringing a conclusion to the War of the Commonwealth, which is basically the conflict between the four Fallout 4 factions determining who has control over the Commonwealth. And it is more or less the sole survivor that is able to conclude this conflict and have a single faction have dominance over the Commonwealth. Or would dominion over the Commonwealth be more accurate? Anyway, as for the Dragonborn, the Dragonborn does have a similar questline. However, it's not a part of his main questline, unlike with the sole survivor. I am of course referring to the Civil War in Skyrim. Now unlike the Soul Survivor, it is not actually canon if whether or not the Dragonborn gets involved. But what is canon, and this can be proven simply by playing the game, is that if the Dragonborn does get involved, then he too has the ability to pretty much single-handedly bring the conflict to its conclusion. So as for this, I believe the Soul Survivor does have a slight advantage, because in the Soul Survivor's case, he starts the game at around the same time the conflict is beginning, and ends it also during the playthrough, so the Soul Survivor both begins and ends the conflict, whereas for the Dragonborn's case, when he gets involved in the Civil War in Skyrim, if he does, the war has already been going on for a decent amount of time. So ultimately, the Soul Survivor has a slight advantage because he was able to both start and finish the conflict, kind of, whereas the Dragonborn simply ended it. That said, I haven't talked about what the Dragonborn's main questline is, something that is canon which he does. That is, literally killing a dragon that no one else is able to kill at all, and that if he doesn't kill, will literally consume the entire world hence the name World Eater. And that's not to mention that the Dragonborn would kill a lot of other dragons along the way. Now as for DLC, what the Soul Survivor does is end another conflict on an island of Far Harbor, but that conflict is nowhere as large as the one in the Commonwealth mainland, and also either joins a massive army of raiders and becomes its leader, or destroys said entire army of raiders. In comparison, The Last Dragonborn literally goes to a Daedric realm to defeat the first Dragonborn there ever was, and The Last Dragonborn also destroys either an entire army of vampires or an entire army of vampire hunters, both of which are far more worse enemies than raiders. It's safe to say that The Dragonborn is the winner when it comes to feats in-game. Now the last thing I want to talk about before we come to the conclusion of this versus hypothetical is what I refer to as countermeasure capability. What I mean by that is the ability that one character has to counteract or defend themselves against the abilities, equipment, etc. of the other character. And I believe that this one also goes to the Dragonborn. You see, the thing about the Dragonborn's shouts, especially the examples that I mentioned earlier, is that they fundamentally make the Soul Survivor's advantages, particularly his equipment, obsolete. For example, the Dragonborn's Marked for Death shout would make the Soul Survivor's armor's defense capabilities greatly reduced, and in that case, the only thing that the Soul Survivor's power armor would do is slow him down. And I think that most of the Soul Survivor's weapons are made relatively obsolete by the Dragonborn's use of slow time and become eternal, which as we mentioned before, makes the Dragonborn temporarily invincible. Now though these shouts only last for a few seconds and need a decent amount of time to recharge afterwards, 
they would give the Dragonborn enough time to give him an advantage, such as getting close enough to the Soul Survivor, while let's say the Soul Survivor is reloading. I could keep going with other examples of how the Dragonborn can counteract the Soul Survivor's advantage, but I think the point has been made that the Dragonborn wins when it comes to his ability to counteract the Soul Survivor's advantages. So now that we've addressed the various factors, I now have reached a conclusion as to who I believe would win in a fight between these two. And if you've been keeping track of the scoreboard, you will of course know that it is the Dragonborn. Because in lore, the Dragonborn is simply far too powerful of a character. And so powerful that he easily counteracts any advantages that the Soul Survivor would have. So that is my conclusion. But you may of course disagree with it, which is completely understandable. If you do disagree, or if you simply have anything else to add, feel free to use the comment section to do so, and I will see you guys in the next video.